David Graeber is here. He is a longtime political activist. Bloomberg Businessweek has called him the anti leader of Occupy Wall Street. On top of that, he is an anthropologist. Graeber is known for asking big questions about what exactly money is and how it affects our society. His latest book is called Debt The First 5,000 Years. I am pleased to have him back at this table as part of an ongoing conversation about government and capitalism and economic systems. So, welcome. Good to have you here. It's good to be here. Tell me how we ought to understand, in your judgment, uh, debt. Mm. Because well, your book is titled Debt, in the First 5,000 Years. It is. Um, well, you know, I, I first got the idea of writing the book because I was puzzled by the strange moral power debt has. The fact that um, it can be used to justify things that it's you would think couldn't be justified in any other way. It all starts actually when I'm having a conversation with a liberal lawyer in London about um, IMF austerity packages and campaigns against them, which I was involved in, in the global justice movement, and talking about deaths of babies in Africa, you know, when people have to cut uh, medical services and the results are catastrophic. And she asked, well, yes, but what did you propose to do about it? And um, I said, well, we thought they should cancel the debts, and, and she was shocked. She was, but, you know, they brought the money. I mean, surely you have to pay your debts. Mm -hmm. and, and that line it just seemed so simple and powerful. I mean, and I thought to myself, well, under what other circumstance would it, a very nice person like this actually support something that would lead to the deaths of thousands of babies? What is it about debt that uh, it just seems like morality is a matter of paying your debt? So it's the very essence of morality, despite the fact that the results are often things that you couldn't morally justify in any other possible way. And I realize that this problem has been around for a very long time. Uh, it's one reason why the book has a 5,000 year scope. This kind of argument this, um, has been going on apparently since we have written records. You have people on the one hand saying morality is just a matter of paying your debts, and on the other hand saying, on the other hand, people who lend money are basically evil. And both those threads seem to run throughout world history. So I started thinking about what debt is, and, and, and I finally came to the conclusion that debt is really best conceived as a, a kind of perversion of a promise. Um, the moral power comes from the fact that it is a promise, and, and promises are always considered sacred. In a way, our society is built on a series of promises we make to one another. But at the same time, it's a very peculiar type of promise because it's a promise that has been made impersonal by a kind of a combination, perverted you might even say, by a combination of math and violence. And generally speaking, when mathematics and violence come together, bad things tend to ensue. But in this case, um, the effect is to make a, de a promise transferable to others. In a way, that's what money uh, is. It's a transferable promise. Money is just debt. Uh, when you look at Europe today, mm -hmm. there are certain countries that look down on other countries uh, because they believe they have, in their uh, economic life, been frugal, mm -hmm. uh, and others have, in their economic life, been profligate, and now they're being asked to bail out the other. And so there's some political uh, fallout from that. Right. It's another perfect example of what I'm talking about. It's a moral language. It has nothing to do with economics. It's not like Greek people work less than Germans. As a matter of fact, someone did a study and discovered that Greek workers actually work more hours than German, uh, German ones. It's not like Greek people are getting better social services than Germans are. They're getting less good social services. So it's not like they've been having a party and not paid for it. Um, you know, the real origins of the Greek crisis go back to military and security spending. They have the highest military and security spending in Europe. Um, but somehow this is the collective responsibility of the entire Greek people. And, and in German media, they actually use phrases like debt sinners. It's, it's totally moralized. And in fact, you mm -hmm. suggest that in certain languages, uh, the word for guilt and the word for debt is the same. It's a really fascinating thing. Um, when I started reading religious texts, you find this over and over again. Uh, you find it in the, um, the Vedic literature and the Brahmanas. Uh, the word for debt and sin and guilt in Sanskrit is the same word. Um, in Aramaic, actually, the famous forgive us our trespasses, uh, in the original Aramaic, it's forgive us our debts, just as we forgive those who owe us money. Of course, the implicit message is, well, you, you don't actually forgive those who owe you money, do you? So, in effect, we're all sinners. Um, and, but here's the weird thing. 
you always see them start by saying, yes, debt, sin, guilt, they're the same thing. Morality is just paying your debts. Your life is a debt you owe to the gods, so forth and so on. But then they back off. And they, if you read it very closely, they're actually saying, except not really. Actually, in the Hindu scriptures, for example, you can only really repay the debt by realizing the debt doesn't exist, by becoming mm -hmm. the thing you repay your parents by becoming a parent, for example. Um, in the Bible, it's not paying your debts that's sacred, it's forgiving debts, it's mm -hmm. canceling debts, jubilee. So the question is, why do they have to start with that if they don't really believe yeah. it? You also suggest that China, because it holds so much American debt, uh, mm -hmm. it's the first stages of a very, very long process in some minds mm -hmm. to reduce the United States uh, to a client. Well, this is something that China has done throughout world history. So you, it would be hard to imagine that some people there aren't thinking along those lines. That's the way they dealt with uh, the northern barbarians, as they always called them, scary militaristic foreigners, which is undoubtedly how they see us. Um, you shower them with gifts. You, you get them dependent. They had this tribute trade where they always gave more to their vassals than they got back. But the idea was, on the one hand, to to spoil them, to make them complacent and dependent, and gradually then you move in and absorb them, mm -hmm. um, or can turn their military prowess to your advantage rather than against you. Some people think that the long-term strategy is going to be to turn America into a sort of military enforcer for East Asian capital. I don't know if that's really the case. Right. Let me ask this, because I, I believe in questions and big questions, and, and you have said that the intellectual consensus has been that we no longer in this society ask big questions. Yeah. What big question should we ask? Well, I thought about that after 2008. I'm, there was a moment where people were questioning everything. Uh, the Economist ran a headline saying capitalism. Was it a good idea? Um, everybody started asking, well, what is a financial system actually for? What's an economy actually right. for? What is debt? Why do we have to pay Because they've seen it, it either collapsing or near collapse. Exactly. And, and all the stories we had been told that markets run themselves, that the people running them are these incredible geniuses or the only people who are competent to run an economy, turned out not to be the case. Um, so there seemed to be a moment where people were willing to start asking questions. And, and it was almost as if a panic set in. Um, after two or three weeks, it was just like, no, no, just keep calm and carry on. Nothing to see here. Just move along. And we've just been trying to pretend nothing happened ever since, which, of course, is going to be disastrous because something like that is going to happen again. They didn't resolve any of the underlying issues. They just put a big Band-Aid up. What basically. was the underlying issue? Well, the underlying issue, um, was it debt? <laughs> um, well, they certainly haven't resolved the debt crisis. There's right. a series of underlying issues. Um, I mean, that's why you ask the big questions, is to figure out what the underlying, the underlying issues, issues are. are. Yes. Yeah. Um, but certainly debt is, as, as a problem, has not been resolved at all. We've been skating from one debt crisis to another since the 70s, really. Uh, for the first 20, 30 years, it was largely confined to the Global South, so we didn't pay a lot of attention. Uh, now it's kind of come back on us, partly because the Global South successfully resisted. The IMF was kicked out of East Asia. They were kicked out of Latin America. For a while, it looked like organizations like that weren't even going to survive. And now, of course, they found a new home in Southern Europe. Talk about Wall Street movement. You know, and mentioned mm -hmm. your prominence in that. Tell me how you saw your role. I saw my role, you know, I saw it mainly as a generational bridge. I've been involved in the global justice movement. And the funny thing about activist generations, people burn out very quickly. It's very intense. Um, so after three or four years, you show up, it's all new faces. I'd been away largely in London. Um, I came back to New York. I had a year of leave. And it was all new people. And, um, and you know how it is. Uh, for a lot of people in the global justice movement, at least, we were sort of banging our heads against the wall for years and gradually giving up. And it's like, this year, it's going to really be back, you know? It's going to happen. Um, this dream we had of direct democracy sort of becoming contagious and sweeping the nation, changing our very idea of what politics were. We all had an idea that it could happen. And, and we just kept getting our hopes up and having them dashed. And I had a sense this time that it was real. Um, and. So I think a lot of what I did was just call up my friends and say, no, no, it's really going to happen this time. Take my word for it. Come up, come back. Come back from the farm in upstate New York or wherever you are now and do some trainings, do medical trainings, legal trainings, affinity groups, you know, teach people how to teach people our old tricks because there's a bunch of young people who are really motivated and something's really going to happen. And is it? Well, I mean, we never expected anything like what happened. I mean, 500 occupations or something like that in a matter of months, uh, um, things happening all over the globe. Obviously, something that explosive 
it's not going to continue like that at that pace for years on end. I mean, every movement has its ups and downs, and the, it was so meteoric at the beginning that, you know, obviously there's going to be a certain settling down, and, and we settle in for the long haul, because, I mean, social movements don't actually achieve things in a year. They, they need a decade, usually, to really change the face of society. Are there any similarities between Occupy Wall Street and the Tea Party? They have a concern with debt, but in very different ways. <laughs> okay, but go ahead. I mean, uh, you know, actually, and, and we just had, as we take this, mm -hmm. um, an election in Texas, where the Tea mm -hmm. Party did very well mm -hmm. uh, and elected their candidate as the nominee of, of the party. I think the Tea Party people understand uh, against the yeah. lieutenant governor, who was very popular and mm -hmm. had been endorsed by the governor. Yeah, no, I think that the Tea Party represent one aspect of the general disillusionment that Americans have with the political system. I think that one thing that... And so I, they share that. Yeah, we share a sense that politicians are basically corrupt, that what we call a democracy is either dysfunctional or not a democracy at all. I don't think it's a democracy at all. Um, How, what would you call it? Uh, kleptocracy? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I could think of a lot of phrases, some of them more impolite. Um, but and the most impolite would be? <laughs> well, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, a fraud. I mean, I think, I think that, that we are, what we have is not a democratic system. It's a system of, of, of legalized bribery. Um, in most countries, if you give politicians money to influence their vote, that's called bribery. It's, it's corruption. It's illegal. We've managed to eliminate the corruption problem largely by legalizing it. It's, it's not illegal. But this is not the only politician. place where not, uh, people from the private sector don't give to political parties or give to uh, the electoral process. It's true. Corruption is in, exists in many places. Uh, but, I mean, it's systematic. And, and most places... It's, it's not nearly so uncontrolled. Mm -hmm. uh, people are still put in jail. For example, in Italy, uh, one of the platforms of a populist party, the Five Star Movement, is that any politician who's gone over a certain level of the criminal process for corruption charges should not be allowed to hold office, and that's about a third of politicians. Yeah, but politicians <laughs> go to jail here for accepting... No, they do. Oh, you know yes. That. I mean, they, of course, they have to leave some things illegal. Yeah. But um, the, the no, basic and, and idea... And go to jail, too. It's true. There's always there are, there's limits to every system, and, and that's how you can say we're not corrupt. You have a few things that are just so out of line that you know you can arrest people for it. Uh, but the fact is, I mean, it's money that drives the system. And most people don't vote, and, and most people don't vote because their votes don't matter. My vote has never mattered. I'm from New York, so my vote has never mattered. And, and, because New York, in the end, like Texas, doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So when you it have a swing states that matter. So how you can call it a democracy if most of the peop of the electorate actually has no influence so on the election? So what should do? Change the electoral system and then you fix it? Well, I wouldn't hurt. I mean, I... A I, new I, constitutional <laughs> convention of some kind? I mean, I'm myself take a long-term view. I'm an anarchist. I believe that I'd like to see a genuinely free society. And what I see as a genuinely free society is one without systematic bureaucracies of violence. So I'm against states. Okay. Um, so it's, I'm not here to tell people what to do, but I, I do, as a yeah. sociologist, say, well, this is not a democratic system. But you sense. are an anarchist in the world of ideas or more? Oh, more. I mean, one thing that um, we felt very important to Occupy was creating institutions that could exist in a free society. And that's critical. Um, we don't want to enter into the political process, not just because it's inherently corrupt, and unless you have a billion dollars, you're not on a level playing field, um, but because if you engage with that system, you become part of it. Um, and as a result, any t that space that where you can try to imagine what real democracy would be like almost completely evaporates. People start acting like politicians. They say one thing to please their funding base, another thing in private. Um, they calculate how they can um, influence important political actors. Everything gets organized around personalities. It, it loses everything that really made this thing vital and important to us, which was the chance to experience what genuine democratic decision making could be like. When did you think, when do you look back at our own history and say we, quote, lost it? Well, it's an interesting question. It's not as if we started as a democracy. I mean, 
I always like to well, point out. Less than a democracy because women and African Americans couldn't vote. Well, yes, indeed. And as a matter of fact, when we started, I always point this out that there is nowhere in the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence does it say anything about America being a democracy. Those guys were explicitly against democracy and they said so. Um, John Adams was like quite up front, he said, we can't have a majority vote. There's nine million people with no property, maybe one or two million people with property. If we allowed majority vote, the first thing they'd do is they'd abolish the debts and then they'd, you know, redistribute the land. So he said this. Um, so they were anti-democratic. They set up the system which is sort of I, their ideal was Republican Rome rather than Democratic Athens. That's, Let me come back yeah. to a couple of points. One, and they just one. renamed it a democracy in the 1830s, and ever since we're supposed to call it that, but that's never what it was supposed to be. Uh, what's the relation between democracy and capitalism? It's an interesting question. Again, it depends on how you define democracy. I, if you define it the way we now do is this Republican system of government, which is originally created to suppress democracy, well, they, they, they work quite well together. I think that it would not be possible to have a genuinely democratic society, that is, one in which people actually deliberated collectively and solved their decisions in a reasonable fashion um, through public assemblies and various other democratic forms. And you know, you'd have to co come up with more complicated things when you're on large lo larger levels of administration. There's lots of ideas about what a really democratic society would be like. I don't think that would be possible with vast inequalities of wealth. I think that in a way the founders were right when they said if we have a system where a few people have all the wealth and other people don't you mm -hmm. can't open it up to everyone you have to have a situation where people are not forced to pursue economic interests um, because of their desperate situation before people can sit around and mm -hmm. you know, think reasonably about what's best for everyone but I think it's possible to achieve that. Mm -hmm. You also said mm -hmm. that uh, it's not it's not unimaginable, or you said there's good reason to believe that in a generation, mm -hmm. capitalism will not exist. Again. One, how are we measuring a generation? And two, <laughs> not uh, the three what does it one. mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and two, yeah. you know, what does it mean capitalism will not exist? Well, I'm simply thinking of it this way. Um, capitalism, I mean, there's a million definitions of what it is, right? Um, but they all seem to agree that it, it depends on growth. Um, that if you don't have 5% national growth a year, you're not really pulling it off. Well, um, wait a minute, there are lots of got almost all of Europe. <laughs> I know, and, it's, it's, we, and we're, the United we're in the doldrums, everybody you know, says that. And, and there are few, <laughs> and China's going from you mm -hmm. know, double digits down to eight or maybe maybe seven even. Precisely. Depending on how, whose prophecy you believe. But Which is one know, reason why we have this that, financialization and, and debt crisis. And Brazil, yeah. mm -hmm. which all these emerging nations mm -hmm. are finding some slippage in their annual growth as well. Absolutely, I, this is the point that I'm making. Um, for capitalism to be viable, it depends on this kind of growth. If that growth ends, and it has to because, frankly, the planet can't actually sustain. The it. other argument is simply that, in fact, quite the reverse is happening. What's happening mm -hmm. is the rise of the middle class around the world mm -hmm. is creating a bigger demand, and therefore capitalism will, quote, flourish. Well, okay. Um, the problem with that is resources. Um, you don't actually have enough metal in the crust of the earth for everyone in China to have a car. Um, so the standards that we've come to expect... So you build plastic mm -hmm. cars. Well, that's a petroleum product. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the, we're clearly hitting some kind of uh, limits, and global warming is just you know, the most obvious example of that. Um, you know, people are sounding greater and greater alarm bells every day about this sort of thing. Um, now, no, it's so, true. But, but okay, but then you, you make the argument... Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Can capitalism and environmental standards coexist? Well, this is the interesting question. Or in ca capitalism, if it demands a certain level of growth, can it coexist? Um, we all thought so. I'm, I'm going to be honest. Uh, people in the global justice movement imagined when we sort of made up our plans, you know, because we had to think, well, what's their plan so we can counteract it? We all thought green capitalism was going to be the big thing, that right. they were going to go from the current sort of debt-based neoliberal phase to this new green capitalism and declare an emergency and use it to approach appropriate even more resources to themselves. Um, and we were kind of shocked that they didn't do it. Um, it's, and this is what I mean by people are incapable of thinking big. You know, we can't come up with an effective response unless the other side comes up with their evil plan. And, and they don't really mm. seem to be able to do so. There's this incredible lack of the ability to 
you know, come up with visionary solutions, which world leaders used to have. Some of those visionary solutions were quite horrible, but at least they were capable of doing so. Do you use the word anarchist to define yourself because you don't like any other word? I mean, you don't want to look at communism, at communism, you don't want to look at socialist, you don't want to look at fascist, you don't want to look at any other word that might describe a political philosophy, so therefore you settle on anarchy? No, I, I, I settle on anarchy because I don't think anarchism is crazy. I think that very few people dislike the idea that everybody could cooperate and is, get rid of police and prisons and just all behave reasonably with one another. They so just think it's impossible. Yeah. It is simply is is more like libertarianism. Well, um, I. It, the word libertarianism was actually coined by anarchists because people associated anarchists with bomb throwers right. and then the right appropriated it. Uh, but uh, I think we also disagree with contemporary libertarians because they think that there will be capitalism and markets in a free society and we feel that there won't. I mean, uh, it's a matter of prophecy. Uh, they seem to think that, you know, you can have this island where um, everybody, there's no state but everybody um, who has property just sort of hires everybody who doesn't. And um, even if we can have an island over here where everybody has you know, a sort of equal division of basic um, needs and um, carries on from there, we think that all the proletariat from their island will come to ours and therefore uh, it won't work. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to wind this up in the following way. No, no, I, I'm looking for a better way to ask this, but I don't have a better way. Okay. Uh, so what, what, after capitalism, in your judgment, mm -hmm what exists and what do we call it? Well, okay. Here's the problem, I think. I'm not so worried that capitalism will survive. Um, everything comes to an end. This, si this system shows all signs of not being able to but fix it, but itself. But it wasn't but so long ago uh, when mm -hmm. Francis Fukuyama was writing the end of history because they thought exactly the opposite. I know. Isn't it remarkable how quickly things change? Uh, but so, so here we have the system we thought was going to last forever, self-destructing before our eyes. What I'm really worried about is the next thing they come up with might be even worse. Uh, it could be some sort of fascist. Who is they? Well, whoever ends up picking up the pieces. Um, uh, which might be, I mean, there are models out there, the sort of populist, authoritarian, uh, sort of China model is very popular in the third world right now. I think it's all the more important to develop actual democratic alternatives. I mean, so when people ask me, what's my alternative to capitalism? I call it democracy. Um, why not have economic democracy? Have a system where people collectively make decisions that affect their own lives. Uh, how that's going to work out? So you don't think we've ever made democracy work? We've come close every now and then, but no, I, I, I th as I say, the system was not set up to be a democracy. I think democratic elements emerged. Um, the, what politicians found is that ordinary Americans loved the idea of democracy, even though politicians at first hated it. So they kind of came around. Yes, and you, 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 you and I <laughs> yeah. both have friends, uh, maybe not the same friends, right. who, who simply say, who, who lived in, um, mm -hmm. in communist countries, and they'd say, aha, mm -hmm. communism didn't fail, we never got it right. Sure. Um, and you're saying we've never gotten democracy right. I, I, I don't think people were really even trying, to be honest, and most of the time. I think there's nothing that terrifies the people running the political system in America more than the danger of democracy breaking out. If you look at the violent reaction they had to a bunch of camps in public parks, which were really hurting anybody, right? Um, you know, they, the people were shot with plastic bullets, tear gassed, um, put in the hospital regularly. I mean, we still can't meet in public without being physically assaulted, despite the fact that we have this thing called the First Amendment, which appears to appeal appears to have been repealed now, um, saying that this is a fundamental democratic yeah. right. Um, why did they react in this panic fashion? I think the only explanation is they're terrified of real democracy breaking out. Jillian Tett, who all of you who watch this program know, or most programs I do, because she is often a guest, says about this in the Financial Times, fresh, fascinating, Graeber's book is not just thought-provoking, but also exceedingly timely. His sweeping narrative history essentially argues that many of our existing ideas about money and credit are limited, if not wrong. That from Jillian Tett. Uh, I thank you for coming. Oh, thank you. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.